Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Understanding Hepatitis B and Liver Cancer. This webinar is put on by the Hepatitis B Foundation and Hep B United, and we're so excited to welcome two esteemed speakers today to our session. My name is Katherine Freeland, and I'm the Public Health Program Director at the Hepatitis B Foundation. Before we get started today, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items just so you can participate in today's webinar. All attendees today will be in listen-only mode. You can join by using your computer audio or by phone with the numbers listed on this page. You can also view closed caption by viewing the link listed on this slide. It's also available for you in the chat box. Throughout the webinar, you're encouraged to submit questions that you have, um, and we'll be sure to have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Today's session is being recorded and slides and the video to today's session will also be sent out to all attendees and registrants. To get you engaged with our session today, we'd like to start out with a poll question. Our first poll question is, true or false, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer is much more common in men than women. True or false? So if you're a participant, please select true or false. And we'll give you just a couple more minutes to fill out the poll. All right. It looks like we had about 76% of you vote today. Um, and you all thought, uh, for the most part, that this is true. Hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer is much more common in men than when, women. And this is true. According to the American Cancer Society, liver cancer is much more common in men than in women. Great job, everyone. And we're, we are talking about liver cancer uh, because October is Liver Cancer Awareness Month, and we're excited um, to share today's session with you. Um, just to give you a bit of resources, um, we want to uh, point out our website at hepb.org. Uh, we are a national nonprofit dedicated to finding a cure for hepatitis B and improving the quality of life for those living with hepatitis B. And today we'll be talking about the connection between hepatitis B and liver cancer and steps that you can take if living with hepatitis B to prevent liver cancer. We also run a local coalition or national coalition, coalition excuse me, called Hep B United. Um, Hep B United was established by the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations to address hepatitis B. We're made up of over 40 organizations across the country, including 24 state coalitions within 23 cities and 20 states. We're working to raise the profile of hepatitis B and liver cancer as an urgent public health priority by improving testing for hepatitis B vaccination and access to care for those with hepatitis B to prevent liver cancer and liver disease. Today we have a great panel of speakers for you. We'll start out with a Just Be storyteller, Wendy, who will share a bit about her story and experience. Uh, then we're, she's going to be followed by Dr. Kenneth Rothstein, who's a director of regional outreach and regional hepatology, a professor of clinical medicine at Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're excited to welcome both. Uh, we're gonna start out today with Wendy's story. Um, so just give me one second. Um, all right. I was diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B when I was in university. At the time, I knew very little about the disease. This was before the internet existed. I did know, though, that I had acquired it at birth from my mom and that it was infectious, so I needed to make sure that those close to me were protected. So after my fiance found out he had the antibodies, I made no changes to my lifestyle. I was not monitored for any progressive liver disease and I continued to have an occasional glass of wine. Then in 1998, my mom was diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer. My whole family was shocked by the diagnosis. We had not been informed that hepatitis B led to a higher risk of liver cancer. In fact, my mom had only received one abdominal ultrasound in her lifetime, and that was when she found out she had cancer. She also did not have her liver enzymes or her alpha theta protein, which is a tumor marker checked. When she did have a blood test, after her diagnosis, her numbers were through the roof. Her liver was not in good shape. She was prescribed lamivudine, which was the only antiviral medication available at that time. It was too late, though, to reverse the liver damage. 
Despite the dire prognosis, my mom decided to receive chemotherapy as a desperate attempt to prolong her life. Sadly, this treatment only made her last few months on earth miserable, and she died soon after. Even though I was devastated by my mom's death, it was a wake-up call for me to take hepatitis B more seriously. I stopped drinking alcohol socially and tried to avoid being exposed to toxic chemicals. No more nail polish for me. I always enjoyed exercise and tried to eat a healthy diet, so I just continued with that routine. Very importantly, I began to receive regular blood tests to monitor my liver function and enzyme levels. As well, I had abdominal ultrasounds twice a year and more recently, fiber scans of my liver. At the time, my specialist said I was still in phase one of the disease, meaning I had a very high viral load and relatively normal liver enzyme levels. Fiber scan of my liver showed that I did not have any scarring. Because of these test results, my specialist said I did not need to be on antivirals. I also began researching many articles about hepatitis B as I thought it was important to educate myself about the disease. I found out what medications were available and how effective they were in case I would have to begin taking them. I joined the local liver association in my area and I learned so much from their educational materials and seminars. As well, I'm very grateful to have become involved with the Hepatitis B Foundation as a storyteller. I've been so impressed by the dedicated and talented people in this organization and their efforts to raise awareness about this condition. Knowing that they are working towards finding a cure means so much to me. Nevertheless, living with hepatitis B has had a profound impact on my life. Thankfully, I did not have to deal with being treated differently by the people that I told about my condition or have my employment affected. However, I battled with fatigue on a daily basis. Sometimes I didn't have the energy to play with my kids when they were younger. And I certainly never took on chauffeur duty for the early morning practices. As well, I was only able to work part-time, even though I was often asked to accept a full-time position. My coworkers would sometimes make fun of me for not being willing to work extra, as they did not know about my condition. I did not feel comfortable telling them. I enjoyed my job, but I retired early since I was just too exhausted to keep working even part-time. Dealing with the anxiety of waiting for results after every blood test and ultrasound has also been difficult. I never knew if my tumor marker was going to be elevated or if the ultrasound would detect cancer, especially since I wasn't on medication because I had read studies that found being on antivirals lowered your risk of liver cancer. Then earlier this year, my liver enzymes started to rise and my specialist recommended that I begin taking antivirals. I have to admit, I was somewhat relieved that I would start taking medication as I hoped that it would reduce the chances of me developing fibrosis or cancer. Unfortunately, I've had a rare allergic reaction to both entecavir and tenofovir, the two frontline antivirals available. My skin erupts into painful rashes every night since I started taking medication. When I told my specialist, he said I could skip a dose every other day, even though I know antivirals are supposed to be taken daily. Now I have to live with the fear that my liver might not be protected from a consistent dose of medication in my body but also reluctant to take a pill that leads to such extreme discomfort. It is not a pleasant place to be. And honestly, I can only hope and pray for a functional cure in the not too distant future so that I don't have to take antivirals anymore and live with the fear that one day I too will develop liver cancer. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing your story with us. It's so important to keep your concerns and thoughts uh, related to hepatitis B at the forefront of our discussion, especially for those that have personal experience and connection with hepatitis B. So we want to thank you, uh, Wendy, for sharing with us. Um, we have another poll. Um, this poll, uh, let me just pull it up. So true or false? Worldwide, the most common risk factors for liver cancer are chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection. So please select 
true or false if you think um, this is an accurate statement. I'll just give you guys a couple of seconds to respond. Oh. Let's share those results with you. All right, it looks like everybody thought that this is true and that is correct. You guys are a smart bunch and thanks for participating in our polls. All right, um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rothstein who will be talking about screening for hepatocellular carcinoma in 2020. So Dr. Rothstein, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk today about screening for liver cancer. I want to say a couple of things first, based on uh, the testimonial of Wendy. Number one, there's no doubt that chronic liver disease leads to significant fatigue, and it's somewhat the curse of liver disease that you may look normal, but you don't feel normal, and you have a hard time acting like a normal person. The other thing I wanted to say, uh, based on what you said, was that it is true that if you treat someone with active hepatitis B and they respond, they're less likely to develop liver cancer, but it's unclear for some patients if treatment does lower the risk. I also make a couple of comments about the Hepatitis B Foundation. I've been involved with the Hepatitis B Foundation for almost three decades, and uh, it's been a, a pleasure working with them and trying to spread the word about hepatitis B. And finally, the last thing I want to say is my picture is a little different than the one that you saw previously because I have not had a haircut since the pandemic started. It's going close to 10 months now, nine months, but uh, eventually my boss is going to force me to get a haircut. So I will be getting a haircut soon. So let's go on to the slides now. So I'm going to touch on a couple of different things in the next half hour the epidemiology of cancer, how do we prevent it? What are the guidelines? What does screening do for it? What do we do when we find a mass in the liver? Talking a little bit about the conference that we held every week to go over scans, the current status of screening in the future directions. It's hard for me to give a lecture without going through this slide. So I stole this from a, a motivational speaker named Rolf Vernischke, who was a place kicker for the San Diego Chargers 30 years ago, who got hepatitis C from a blood transfusion. And he said, as a patient, what he wants from a healthcare worker is he wants competency. And the fact that everyone's here today means you want to be competent. He wants honesty. Everyone wants honesty. He wants healthcare workers to be caring. Those were his three things. The next three are mine. They want you to be nice, personable, communicate, be available, and more importantly, or maybe not more importantly, they want free parking. So let's go a little bit about hepatocellular carcinoma or hepatoma or HCC. It is the fifth most common cancer in women, the seventh, I'm sorry, in men, seventh in women worldwide. It is the third leading cause of death from cancer worldwide, as opposed to many other cancers where mortality is going down, we're seeing a rise in the incidence and the death rates. And as you correctly pointed out in your poll, it's primarily due to hepatitis B and C. And clearly worldwide, hepatitis B is the main driver of liver cancer. In the US, it's more due to hepatitis C and fatty liver or NASH. So globally, 600,000 deaths annually. And I worked it out. It seems that every second someone in the world is dying of, of hepatoma. So it's a major, major problem. And it's what's really sad is that it's a problem that can be prevented very easily. I mean, I just I'll get through it later on in the talk, but we should be able to cut that in half, if not by 90%, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And the Hepatitis B Foundation is helping to do that. 
The majority of the cases, over 80%, occur in people who live or, or from Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And that's important when you think about immigrants to this country. And I think the last line is really so, so important because when I was in medical school 30 years ago, I'm sorry, 34 years ago, there was nothing you could do for liver cancer. And I'm talking about primary liver cancer or HCC. There was nothing you could do. The six month survival was 5%. And now we have so many different ways to treat this disease that our five year survival is approaching 90%. But again, that's in the patients that we diagnosed early. This is a slide that shows that in the US, we had 42,000 cases of HCC in 2018 and about 1,300 liver transplants, but we're still going to see a continued increase in the years ahead. Next slide. Okay, so this is the regional variation in the rates of liver cancer. If you look towards our area, hepatitis C, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver is causing it. If you look at Europe, it's alcohol and, the, and fatty liver, a little bit of hep C. But if you look in Africa and Asia, it's mostly hepatitis B. And uh, worldwide, I still think hepatitis B accounts for more than 50% of the cancers. This slide says 50%, but I think it's closer to 80% like a previous slide. Next. Now this slide's important because it talks about chronic hepatitis B all over the world. And as you can see that in parts of Asia and Africa and even the Mediterranean, there's a lot of hepatitis B and, and also South America. And these individuals are moving to the US. And so this is the group that we really have to focus in on. It's not primarily the patients that were born here in the US, it's, people who have moved here from these areas and their children. Next slide. HCC is the most common form of liver cancer in the US. You can see that there's also cholangiocarcinoma, which is a bile duct cancer. There's angiosarcoma. There's also secondary liver cancers or metastatic disease. But three quarters of the cases are HCC. And again, from this slide, it was about 30,000 cases a year. So really, it is just an extremely common disease. And when you think about how devastating this disease is, it still mystifies me that we are not doing a good job of finding it early because it would really add, it would save so many lives. Next. This is a little algorithm which talks about how you get cirrhosis and then you get liver cancer. So you could see that things like hepatitis B, alcohol, fatty liver, they lead to the formation of a dysplastic nodule. It's not cancer, but it's precancerous. And it's a low grade, it goes on to a high grade, eventually turns into a small cancer. That's when we should be, we should be picking up these patients and treating them. Then as you move along to the right, it becomes an advanced cancer, but still less than two centimeters. And then it becomes over two centimeters. And then we're talking about potentially spreading. So when you have a patient with cirrhosis, the five-year risk ranges from five to 30%. So the worst case scenario is really awful, about 6% per year. And that's why we strongly recommend looking at the liver every six months. The current recommendation is an ultrasound every six months, along with a blood test called an alpha theta protein. Next slide. You can see here, this is a US study. The number one risk factor in the US is viral hepatitis, primarily hepatitis C, followed 
followed by hepatitis B. There is no doubt that drinking alcohol makes things worse. Smoking makes things worse. If you have B and C, it's gonna be worse. It's gonna work out to be worse. So viral hepatitis is the main driver. We're starting to see a little bit of surge from fatty liver or what we call non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. Next slide. Okay. So I don't know if you can see this young gentleman with President Jimmy Carter, but that was me in my second year of medical school. My grandmother was extremely upset with me because she thought that it was disrespectful for me to meet the president wearing a t-shirt, but I had no idea he was gonna come to our class that day and talk about healthcare. But I was fortunate enough to have him take a picture with me after class. But back then, we were not seeing a lot of liver cancer. We were seeing it a little bit in alcoholic cirrhotics, but we had not yet seen the wave of cirrhosis from hepatitis C. We hadn't seen fatty liver back then. And hepatitis B was not that common because the immigration patterns had not really started. So we weren't seeing anything but alcoholic cirrhosis and liver cancer. Next slide. And as you can see here, this is a uh, little uh, picture of a bottle of vodka. I always put in one very interesting fact when I give lectures about alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis. Only about three to 5% of people who drink a bottle of vodka every day for 30 years wind up getting cirrhosis. So a lot of people get liver disease, but only a small percentage get cirrhosis. But once you get cirrhosis and you'll get cirrhosis from any type of liver disease, you are at risk for developing liver cancer. Next slide. So there's two very important points I wanna talk about. One is related to fatty liver, and the next one will be hepatitis B. In most liver cancers, you have to have a background of cirrhosis in order to develop liver cancer, but there are two exceptions, and NASH is one of them. We are seeing rising rates of obesity in this country and worldwide, so we're seeing a lot more non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's more advanced condition is NASH. These two groups form many of the unknown or cryptogenic causes of cirrhosis. And obviously a NASH patient with cirrhosis is at risk for liver cancer. But if you look at the bottom bullet in this presentation from Vancouver in 2016, 25% of the patients with NASH and liver cancer did not have cirrhosis. This has been shown in multiple studies from all over the world that you don't have to have cirrhosis to develop liver cancer with NASH. The only other liver disease like this is hepatitis B. So in hepatitis B, the virus integrates into the genome and changes something that puts the patient at risk for liver cancer. And as you will see a little bit later, it's widely accepted that certain patients with chronic hepatitis B, irrespective of cirrhosis, need to be screened for liver cancer. In NASH, in fatty liver, we have not reached that point. We don't think the risk is that much greater that we should start screening everybody with fatty liver for liver cancer. But it's clear that it's a little bit more than the average patient and a little bit more than other liver conditions that don't have cirrhosis. So this is something that will develop as time goes forward and we'll see, maybe eventually we'll be screening patients with NASH who are not cirrhotic for liver cancer, just like hep B. Next slide. Okay, so this was me working on my fatty liver about 10 years ago. Uh, I've lost about 40 pounds since then trying to prevent my fatty liver from becoming cirrhotic, uh, but I do try to get screened on a yearly basis for liver cancer. Next slide. As I said before, the incidence and death rates from liver cancer are increasing, and actually it has tripled since 1980. Now we expect to see a little bit of a drop because of the treatment of hepatitis C 
which lowers the risk of liver cancer. But we're really starting to see more liver cancer from older patients with hep B and other patients with fatty liver. So I don't know if this is gonna change in the future. Next slide. So I have a theory on how we can prevent hepatomas in the US. So the first thing is, and we're doing a very good job of this, we're finding and curing hepatitis C patients. We're finding and suppressing hepatitis B patients. I wanna spend a little bit of time on this. Um, I'll get to the next line in a minute. We can suppress hepatitis B patients, but we don't have a cure as of yet. But as I said previously, if you have someone with active hepatitis B and you put them on treatment and you lower their viral load and you lower their liver enzymes, we are seeing less liver cancer. But I will also tell you that I have seen a couple of patients in my career who have been treated with for hepatitis B. They've had an excellent response. They've gotten rid of the hepatitis B surface antigen. They've developed surface antibody. We stopped their medication. And a couple of years later, they present with terminal end stage liver cancer. So I still think at this point in time, even if you have someone in FB who's been successfully treated, you need to screen them. I had a friend of mine from California call me earlier this week and ask me that question. And I said, listen, you have to continue to screen every six months. The third bullet is no smoking, minimal alcohol. We know that smoking raises the risk of liver cancer. Excessive alcohol use does the same. Next slide. I mean, not next slide, next bullet. Okay. Avoid obesity, diabetes, fatty liver. These are all cofactors in the development of liver cancer. There is some evidence about coffee and tea, which I'll get to in a few minutes. It does not have to be caffeinated. It could be decaffeinated, but they've done retrospective studies looking back at patients, asking them about their habits. And it turns out that people who drink coffee and tea, whether it's decaffeinated or caffeinated, tend to have less liver cancer, which is pretty amazing. And finally, statins. Again, there've been retrospective studies showing that the use of statins prevents liver cancers. And one of my colleagues at Penn who works at the VA, David Kaplan, is the lead investigator on a study looking at cirrhotic patients at the VA who do not need statins. Half of them are going to get statins, half of them are not. And they're gonna follow them over five years to see if there really is a difference in the, the development of cancer. Next. What about marijuana? There's a little bit of evidence that smoking marijuana may also prevent hepatomas. I'm not ready to get on the bandwagon and start recommending all my patients start smoking marijuana. But once we get more evidence, I may be recommending that in the future. Next. Okay. This is a journal, a very well-respected journal. And this was the cover a couple of years ago. Can coffee reduce the risk of liver cancer? And many studies have shown there's an inverse relation between coffee consumption, liver enzyme elevation, liver cirrhosis, liver cancer. And it looks like for each additional cup of coffee a day, it lowers the risk of cancer. Anything below one means it's effective. So I personally, do not want to die an ironic death. I have a fatty liver. I do not want to have a liver cancer as the cause of my ultimate demise. I drink a cup of coffee in the morning. I drink a cup of coffee in the afternoon, and then I have either decaf or coffee or tea in the evening. I've gone away from soda, especially diet soda. I don't think there's any evidence that that helps. Next slide. And again, I talked a little bit about statins. 
Most of them have been uh, retrospective studies, but it does look like it does decrease the risk of, stat of cancers. The other important thing is there's been some evidence that it decreases the risk of death and also liver complications. So I think there's a lot to be said for statins playing a role in the chronic treatment of patients with cirrhosis. Next. All right. So let's talk about surveillance. Most of the major societies, which include AASLD, which is the American Society, EASL, which is the European, and APASL, which is the Asian Pacific Association, they all recommend ultrasounds every six months. AASLD has changed their guidelines and they do recommend or give you the option of using alpha feta protein every six months. And you can see the VA and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network also make the recommendation. I personally think screening every 12 months is not, is not a good thing to do. You will miss cancers that could be cured. There are some thoughts that, and this is from Japan, if you're high risk, you should be screened a little bit more often. We, that really has not taken place in the US, uh, but I, I think it may have some merit, but we'd have to see. Next. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on this slide because while I've spoken about this slide many times, I don't agree with it. So let's deal mostly with non-hepatitis B cirrhosis. So hepatitis C, alcoholic liver disease, hemochromatosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, all of the types of cirrhosis, definitely everyone agrees should be assessed every six months for liver cancer. It's the hepatitis B carriers where I have a little bit, bit of disagreement. The thought is Asian males are at higher risk than Asian females. And so you shouldn't start screening unless um, you should only start screening based on age, unless as you can see below, there's a family history of liver cancer. I disagree with that. I've seen a lot of patients, females below the age of 50, males below the age of 40, who have developed liver cancer. The hepatitis B vaccine was the first vaccine that was shown to decrease cancer. And this was a study, if I'm correct, out of Taiwan, where they started vaccinating all the newborns and they saw a decrease in teenage hepatomas. So it does occur in young patients. So it may not be cost effective, but when I have a patient who's young, in their 20s, in their 30s, and Asian, I start screening them. I start screening them once I see them. We all agree cirrhotic hepatitis B carriers get screened. Now, the other thing is Africans over the age of 20. As I said, I wanna spend a little bit of time on this. I work in West Philadelphia and I've been at Penn for three years. And in the last three years, we've had about five or six individuals I think they've all been male. They all from Africa. They all have presented with terminal incurable HCC. One was a patient who was 16 years old and he was not being screened for, for hepat hepatomas. And we actually at, at Penn, we just entered into an agreement with Mercy Philadelphia and West Philadelphia and it's my goal with the help of the Hepatitis B Foundation and anyone else who wants to help to offer free screenings for those who don't have insurance who come from Africa to make sure that we're not missing people with Hepatitis B. The thought is, is that 10 to 15% of individuals from Africa are Hepatitis B surface antigen positive, which is about what we think the rate is from parts of Asia. You can see the last bullet is the high HPV DNA. And again, Wendy talked a little bit about that, but it is clear in the REVEAL study 
which looked at longitudinal assessment of hepatitis B over a 20-year period, that if you presented with a high hepatitis B DNA level, you were more likely to develop liver cancer. And that's led to an argument that we should treat the virus, not the amount of damage you have, not the liver enzymes, but that's still not a consensus statement. And we do approach each individual patient and decide on treatment. But there are unfortunately a lot of people walking around with millions of copy of hepatitis B DNA who do not currently meet guidelines for treatment. Now, the last thing about the hepatitis B carriers that I'm really not happy with is you can see they don't talk about Caucasians, they don't talk about Hispanics, and they actually don't talk about African Americans who were born in the US. And those patients, in my opinion, also need to be screened for liver cancer, but yet it's not in the current guidelines. So that's a point of contention when we are out there trying to get people screened. In all fairness, I have not seen anyone in those groups develop liver cancer in my career unless they had cirrhosis. But I still think there is something about the hepatitis B virus that clearly raises the risk for liver cancer. Next slide. So I don't know if you can see, but towards the middle, towards the, the, the right side of the screen, there is a cancer next to the spine. Now uh, that's the stomach. Keep going to the, look to the left, the left, the, over the, a little bit more there. That's the cancer. This is potentially a cancer that's curable right now. Next slide. This is a liver cancer from hepatitis B in a woman from South America who was only picked up because she got pregnant. When the tumor was picked up, it was only three centimeters. She absolutely refused to have surgery until her baby was born. This is the day after she delivered. You can see the background is a normal liver. By this time, her cancer had grown to about 10 centimeters and it was resected. A year later, no recurrence and her liver had grown back to its normal size. So this is something that we don't ever wanna see. We wanna see small, one to three centimeter tumors that are curable. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna try and go quickly through the next slides because I see we're running out of time, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of studies that show that outcomes, survival are improved among patients who undergo routine surveillance. And you can see the blue line showing that surveillance has a better survival than if you wait for someone to become symptomatic. By that time, it's usually too late. Next. This is another good slide. If you could see there, the first um, thing under outcomes, it shows HCC diagnosis at stage one to two. And you can see with standard of care surveillance, 70% of the patients were picked up. When you have stage one or two cancer, you are potentially curable. If you don't have good surveillance, about 40% of people are curable. And if you don't get surveyed, you only have about 20% of those patients being curable. So again, significant differences in the ability to be transplanted and your mean three-year survival. Next slide. Just another study showing reduction of mortality with screening. Next. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but when we see a, a mass that's less than a centimeter, we follow it very closely. If you go to the next part where it's over a centimeter, then we start getting a little bit more aggressive. We might do more scanning, a CAT scan or an MRI. And then we decide whether we biopsy or not and whether we treat it. Next slide. So again, one of the things that most institutions have, which has been shown time and time again to improve outcomes, is to have a multidisciplinary team looking at imaging of liver masses. So you have interventional radiologists, 
you have diagnostic radiology, you have hepatologists like myself, you have oncology, surgery, pathology. We sit in the room every Friday morning from seven to 9 a.m. That was pre-pandemic. Now we Zoom from seven to nine. And in that room, I would hazard to say we have over 300 years experience looking at these images. Somebody presents the topic, the background of the patient, and then we make a decision. And I have to tell you that it's been a, uh, a great thing for patients. This is done all over the country and study after study show it improves survival and uh, morbidity. Next slide. This is where I get a little upset because I've been working on this for 20 years. This was around 2000 when I was at Einstein and we did a study where we looked at what we were doing to see if we were screening. And you can see here by the title, the failure to screen was not with us, the doctors, it was patient non-compliance. Next slide. And you could see here about 96% of the time, we had documentation that we ordered screening tests to be done. Next slide. But unfortunately, only about a third of the patients got their testing done in a regular manner. And about two thirds of the patients, they had spotty surveillance. They just didn't do it every six months. Maybe they did it once a year, maybe they didn't do it at all. But it, it, it led me to realize that what we're doing is not right and we've got to improve. Now, next slide will show you some improvement. This was another presentation that showed that high-risk patients with hepatitis C and cirrhosis, this is about 2011, so it's about 10 years later, we get a little bit better, okay, in that 12% uh, got routine, 60% got inconsistent, 30% got none. Again, uh, they didn't really spell out exactly what inconsistent was, but it was a little bit better than the 30% that we got. Next slide. And this was more recent, this was about a year or two ago. This was out of Stanford. And they looked at over 60,000 patients with insurance who had chronic hepatitis B. Next slide. And they looked at predictors of surveillance and they were looking at every six to 12 months. So I'm not sure how that factors into it. If you were over 45, you had cirrhosis, decompensated or decompensated, uh, any type of cirrhosis. For reasons I don't understand, the South did better than the Northeast. And I definitely understand females doing better than males, but their conclusion was really poor. Only 12.5% of patients had imaging done once a year. So that's just really, really sad. And it definitely has led me to spend a lot of time thinking about ways to make it better. Next. So these are some of the interventions that we are working on, not just me and Penn with my team, but across the country. Automatic reminders with the electronic medical record or EMR, mail reminders, a written contract with patients, bribery. We're actually doing a study where we're gonna pay patients a nominal fee to get screened. There are some studies where you incentivize the doctors to get it done. Radiology needs to play a role and remind people to get done. We're gonna do some marketing, but I really think the last two bullets are the way to go. Patient navigators. I think you need to have a dedicated team of individuals who take a subset of patients with liver disease, whether it be hepatitis B or others, and just be responsible for making sure they get this done every six months. I can't tell you how many patients I've had in my practice who just kind of disappear. I don't see them for a year or two and they come back with liver pain. We do a scan and they have a big, big tumor that could have been picked up. And one patient in general, I remember for six years, he got imaging every six year, every six months with an alpha beta protein 
And after six years, he kind of got tired of doing it, fell off the face of the earth. Two years later, it presents with liver pain and terminal HCC. The other thing that I am personally working on, and I have a meeting set up tomorrow about this, is I want to help the insurance companies look at their patients who have liver disease and help the insurance companies remind their patients to get screened. Because the bottom line is, we're doing an awful job right now, and we need to do a much better job. Everybody is worried about COVID. I'm worried about COVID. COVID has been devastating, but COVID will eventually be under control. We have ignored cancer during this pandemic, and there are multiple studies showing that, and that we really need to not only fight COVID, but do our job in making sure that we don't forget about finding cancers that are out there, but just not being diagnosed. Next slide. So I'm almost done. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions. How do we improve the hepatic health of the US? And by definition, we're gonna lower the risk of liver cancer. Find and treat all the hep C patients but continue to screen them even after they get cured. Same thing with the hepatitis B patients. Find them, treat them, hopefully someday cure them, but still screen them for liver cancer. Let's do the same thing for all cirrhotic patients. Let's find them and screen them. And the fourth bullet is, which I really hope before I retire in 10 years, two weeks and four days, Identify hepatomas at an earlier stage with better screening modalities. I envision a time in the future for all cancers where you will urinate in a cup once a month, and you'll do a dipstick, and you will know if there's any cancer in your body because we know cancers make proteins at a very early stage, even before we can recognize the cancer. And I think in the future, our technology will reach the point where we will pick up cancers before we even can see them and we'll be watching for them. And when the first sign that we see where they are, we'll treat them. Uh, but we don't have time to go over that. The last thing I want to do is get rid of the organ shortage, but I'm not going to say on a YouTube how I'm going to do that. Next slide. So I might have been off by a week or two. But this is the date of my retirement, November 13th, 2030. It is my 70th birthday, and I am hoping that I am still alive and that my fatty liver doesn't do me in, and I can be on that beach on my 70th birthday. And I will take questions at this point with the help of my moderator. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Rothstein. Um, we hope that you're on that beach too in 2030. <laughs> um, um, so I, that was a great presentation. I want to remind our audience to please submit questions in the question box. Um, but I had a couple of questions and I'll take um, moderator privilege and get us started a little bit. Um, but you had mentioned that you've seen a lot of African or men coming from Sub-Saharan Africa or the African continent who are, you're seeing rates of HCC at really young ages. Do you have any idea why that might be happening? We're not exactly sure why that's happening. Um, the thought is it may be something related to diet. Uh, because maybe the way foods are being prepared, the, the, uh, the, the, the pottery, the cookery or something, but it doesn't make sense because when they come here that you would think that that might change, but we're not exactly sure. But it is clear that um, they are at higher risk. Mm. Definitely. You're not supposed um, to ask me really hard questions, by the way, but okay. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, well, I think we had some comments in the chat box or the question box that said using 
patient navigators to support uh, routine screening for cancer has worked for some of our um, colleagues who are on the line with us now. Have you found other uh, mechanisms that have really been successful so far in your getting people to follow up with the regular screening? I personally have not really found a great mechanism. Um, the, I, I stole this idea. I didn't come up with this idea. I had a patient once who worked for an insurance company. Dr. Rossi, are you still on the line? I think we may have lost your audio. In the, in oh, Philadelphia. there we go. And the, her job was to do nothing but make sure women who took out a postcard reminding patients to get their mammogram. She'd follow up with a phone call and then she'd follow up with another phone call and she could tell who got their mammograms and who didn't. And the insurance company felt that it was financially the right thing to do and the right thing to do. But it's clear that patient navigators are great, you know, for many different other things, getting patients to a cancer doctor, getting them through the cancer workup, getting them through a transplant evaluation. But I don't know of any teams of navigators that are doing this on a regular basis, but I'd love to hear what other people have done. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, one question, well, the first question is, someone wanted to know what beach that was for retirement. <laughs> okay, I think it is a national park. It's an underwater scuba diving national park in St. John. Okay. It looks amazing. Um, it was amazing. <laughs> uh, another question that just came in, um, what is the best way to get primary care providers on board to routinely treat and manage those with hepatitis B? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, it is clear to me that hepatitis B can be successfully managed and treated by primary care physicians, albeit most primary care physicians really don't want to do it. It takes a lot of time and effort, and most primary care physicians are very busy doing other things. But I really think it has to do with education to some degree. Um, I do know that the guidelines for treatment of hepatitis B are somewhat confusing and difficult even for gastroenterologists and even for hepatology sometime. So I definitely think that there needs to be some mechanism in place where these guidelines can be reviewed because you don't want to treat somebody who doesn't meet the guidelines. Wendy talked about having bad side effects from the medication, but I had one patient who developed a very severe side effect from a medication for hep B and died. And fortunately, um, when we reviewed the case, it was indicated that the patient should have been on treatment. But I would hate to incorrectly treat someone and they have a bad outcome. Obviously, every bad outcome is awful. But, you know, you, you want to really pick and choose who needs to be treated. Now, when a cure comes out, I think it will be a different situation. Now, the flip side is for hep C, primary care doctors are treating these patients because it's very simple and everybody needs to be treated. It's not as complicated. Uh, but I fall back on the other thing, either B or C, you need to continue to monitor for liver cancer, even if you successfully treat the patient. So an assessment of fibrosis is very important for these patients. Right. And, and that's every six months at least, right? For people with hepatitis B? I think the guidelines say ultrasound and alpha protein every six months. I think that is basically the best thing to do if and when we can get MRIs to be a little bit cheaper, we may replace ultrasounds with MRI. But right now an MRI is very costly, about three to five, four times as costly as an ultrasound. So from a cost effective standpoint, it's not what's recommended by the societies. But when and if we can get the cost of MRI down to that of an ultrasound, we will be doing MRIs every six months with the AFB. Great, thank you. 
Um, this question, any prediction as to how much longer simpler surveillance te techniques will be developed to detect HCC? I still think it's three to five years away. Uh, I think that I have not heard of anything even being close to being ready for prime time. But I mean, I've been I've been involved with researchers who were doing this 10 years ago. So I know that the research is being done. And I do think that hopefully once we get COVID behind us, all the scientists who are spending all their time on COVID will start doing everything else. Mm. Um, this this next question, probably similar answer. How close are we to a cure for hepatitis B? Well, as I said to Tim Block, who works with the Hepatitis B Foundation and uh, basically is, you know, the man behind the foundation, he said it will happen soon. And I said, I don't think it's going to happen in my professional career. But Tim is very good at proving me wrong, so hopefully he will prove me wrong and there will be something soon, but I still estimate three to five years away, but I'm sure I'll hear about it in about 30 seconds, what he thinks. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, another question, um, is there a physician tool or quick guide that you would recommend to assist primary care providers in hepatitis B management and treatment? Yeah, actually, I think you might be better able to answer this, but I do know that there, there are apps available that can help decide how to treat. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, and I'm not going to spend 10 minutes Googling it while we're talking, but uh, there is a, an app that I have used previously to decide on treatment, but for the most part, I haven't had a tough hepatitis B patient in a long time to use it, but I have used it in the past. Do you know the name of it off the top of your head? Yes, it's called Hep B Consult. Uh, that's one of the Hep B apps. And there's also helpful app algorithms that have been created more recently um, that I can share with the recording of the slides. Yeah. I mean, like I said, the majority of my patients who come to me with hepatitis B clearly meet indications for treatment or clearly do not meet indications for treatment. So I have ha not had to use it in a long time. Uh, this next question, uh, do hep B patients with a family history of liver cancer need to have an ultrasound more often than the guidelines suggest? No, but they need to get screened on a regular basis. So that would be one of the indications to getting imaging every six months and labs every six months. I don't see, I don't know of any evidence that shows that doing it every three months is going to do anything better. But I know that's in the Japanese guidelines, but um, that's not what we're doing in the U.S. right now. Uh, what are few of the newest treatments for HCC that has led to these longer survival rates that you reported on? Well, there's a couple of them. Um, Nivovolab, uh, Serafinib, Nexavar. There's a whole host of uh, immunotherapies and medications, both oral injection, but also we are doing chemoembolization. We're doing Y90, where we're injecting radioactive beads into the cancer. We're trying to resect. We're doing transplants. So we're doing, we're doing uh, directed radiotherapy. So we've been able to take these cancers with or without surgery and cure them. Now, the best way to cure them is to either cut out the cancer or do a transplant. But some of these other regimens can slow down the disease and keep patients alive. One thing that's fallen out of favor, but that I had a lot of success with, was injecting alcohol into a liver cancer. So I had a patient who was very old, very bad heart, had a five centimeter tumor that we could not do anything, we couldn't transplant them or resect them. 
He was injected with alcohol. And for five years, there was no evidence of any growth of that tumor or any residual tumor. And he wound up dying after five years from his heart and not his cancer. So those are part of them. But it seems that every couple of months, we're getting another FDA approval for treatments. Now, again, these are treatments for more advanced cancers to slow it down that don't necessarily cure it. But um, Optivo, uh, which is the first one I mentioned, we had our grand rounds from one of our oncologists showing about 15% of these patients get an incredible response. And we had one patient with an 11 centimeter tumor who six months later, you couldn't see the tumor in his liver. So, but again, that's only about 15% of those patients. But I do think while we are working on better treatments for advanced liver cancer, the way to really improve our survival is to catch these cancers when they're one or two centimeters, where the, the ability to cure them is just dramatic. It's very hard to cure something over five centimeters. So that's what we need to focus in on. Great, thank you. Well, I think that's a great um, stopping point for us, just keeping mind of everyone's time today. Uh, but I wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Rothstein, for sharing with us. I think we had a bunch of questions come through and there was a lot of user engagement. So we really appreciate everyone for attending and you for sharing with us um, today, especially as it's uh, hepatitis or liver cancer awareness month. Um, also, thanks to Wendy for sharing her story with us. Um, it's definitely helpful to have that personal connection um, with liver cancer and have us make aware of, you know, the, that reality of the situation for so many people in the U.S. and, and beyond um, that liver cancer and hepatitis B can have on someone's life. Um, so thanks, Wendy, especially for that. Um, on this slide, um, you can see our, our email address if you have questions. Um, I tried to follow up with you directly, personally, if you responded to a question that wasn't asked out loud. Um, you can also email us at info at hepb.org or check out our websites both listed on this slide. Um, please feel free to complete your evaluation after the webinar so we can know how we're doing. Um, and we, we look forward to seeing you guys on our next session. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Can I add one more thing? Of course, please. So one thing that I like to do as part of these Zoom conferences, which by the way, I absolutely despise, is I do like to try to get to every question. So if it's okay with you guys at the Hepatitis B Foundation, if, yeah. if somehow we could work it out that I could answer every question that someone ha that people have, I'd be happy to do it at a later time. Sure, uh, yeah. If that's okay with you. Of course, what I'll do is I'll forward you the questions in an email and we will respond um, directly to the individual who asked the question. But we only had um, a couple that we weren't able to get to. Okay, well, uh, I can't say I'll do it tonight, but I will get to it. All right. No worries, not at all. All right. Thank thanks you. So much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.